last week. We're reading, please, in Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew 24 and verse number 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, God's very own people. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will be eagles be gathered together. Now this evening I want to talk to you about the rise of the counterfeit. I want to look at the powers behind the proliferation of the cults. And I want us to understand right at the beginning that throughout history, from the very beginning, Satan has time and time again advanced his cause through the medium of religion. It is one of the most powerful weapons in his armory. He uses the incurably religious feeling and desire that there is within mankind. For mankind is incurably interested in religion. And of course, mankind, as he seeks religion, and mere religion wouldn't save anybody, but mankind, as he is incurably religious, seeking out for something, is in fact seeking out to worship something greater than himself, and he'll either worship God or he'll worship an idol, but worship something he will or she will. And I want to tell you that tonight, in the 20th century, this fact is as true as it was in the days of ancient paganism. Man has a hunger for God. He's lonely. And as I heard Billy Graham say in Anfield last summer, and I'll never forget it, he said, you know, you young people, you go to a party, and you sit in the party, and there's a huge crowd of people around you, and as you sit in the party, you suddenly feel lonely. And there's a huge crowd around you, maybe. Maybe jiving and dancing. I don't know. But in the midst of that crowd, you suddenly feel awfully lonely. Or maybe you're walking in the city in the middle of a crowd and you suddenly feel awful lonely. Or you sit in a huge crowd like this this evening and you feel awfully lonely. The psychologists call it cosmic loneliness. There's a loneliness in your heart. Many of you who are unconverted this evening for God, and you don't realize what it is. Oh, what a sad thing that so many young people are so lonely and they don't realize that sex can't fill the loneliness or drugs cannot fill the loneliness or culture can't fill the loneliness or literature can't fill the loneliness. Only God can. And what will it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? And Satan knows that loneliness and Satan knows that hunger and he plays on it and he pollutes the world with false cults. Look at the history of Israel. In Israel, Satan was at his most dangerous and seducive 
when he spoke through false prophets. In the Gospels, the Pharisees were far more dangerous to Jesus than the prostitutes were or the open sinners. And in the final discourse held with his disciples, Jesus warns passionately against being led astray by false messiahs who are skillful enough to deceive the very elect. And that includes you and me if we know the Lord. Don't think you're exempt from being fooled, or don't let me think that I'm exempt from being fooled by Satan. When Paul was giving his farewell address to the Ephesian elders, he warned them against the grievous wolves which will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And the enemy came in like a flood in the early church after Paul went to be with the Lord. And the messianism of Bar Kochba's Zionist revolt very nearly did away with authentic Christianity altogether. And Satan hasn't lost his cunning. It would be very surprising if he had. He is at his most diabolical when he is a teacher of error. And that is why he is accounted a liar from the beginning. He was a liar from the beginning. He was a liar all the way through. He still is a liar, and he has no moral code of conduct. Now, what is our generation like in the 80s? Well, it's skeptical. And it's filled with, in our part of the world, materialism and religiosity. And that gives Satan absolutely easy meat. Because people are credulous. They can be easily taken in. And when they are in this world with all of its sorrow and trouble and trial, and materialism doesn't satisfy, and religiosity doesn't satisfy, it's amazing what they'll believe to try and find some satisfaction somewhere or get peace somewhere. So I want tonight to study the three great mantles which Satan wears as a disguise. They're all attractive, but they're all heavily infected. I'm so thankful to Michael Green for permission to quote from his book, I Believe in Satan's Downfall. A lot of good teaching in that book. And he calls it the counterfeit of cult religion. And that's true, because cults are proliferating at present on a very, very fast scale. And when we're going through in this microchip age coming from the Silicon Valley and in, in, in California and so on, the massive change that we're going through, in times of massive change, that's the time that the cults begin to proliferate. The decline of Orthodox Christianity in the West, the widespread ignorance there is of the Bible, like George Bates was telling me the other night of a man in this city who said to a woman, look, I want to read to you from the Scripture. She said, don't read to me from that book. I know it from Genesis to Revelation. Well, she may have been ignorant of the pronunciation of Genesis, but let me tell you this much, my friend. There are some people who are woefully ignorant of even basic Bible teaching. And there's a hunger for certainty in this city, as in every city across the world at the moment, in a world that is absolutely falling apart. And there's disillusionment with the church, and there's disillusionment with politics, and there's disillusionment with materialism. And in our age, when youngsters have just about tried everything by the age of 15, then the cult is a frontier that they love to cross, and the breakdown of the family contributes a further factor in the present cultural chaos. 
and in the youth festival held in the King's Hall just last week, young people were asked what they thought about their parents as an example, and a huge percentage of them said that their parents' behavior regarding the use of alcohol was not good. It was not a good example that they had. How true that is. Almost every day I'm having to deal with many, many problems related to the family across the country. How sad it is. And whenever young people are caught in the middle of that, up comes the cult, and in they are sucked. I'm seeing it again and again. You'd be amazed where it breaks out. And of course, the cult is so attractive. A Christian leader rang me yesterday. He said, would you please have lunch with me on Friday, Derek? He said, I'm desperately concerned, he said, about what's happening around. He said, the number of young people that are committing suicide. He said, let's meet together. He says, I want to do something. He said, I had to counsel a fellow of 15 years of age, he said, just, just recently. Suicidal tendencies, many young people committing suicide week after week after week, disillusioned. And then sometimes the cult gets in there when they feel like that and sucks them in. You'll find that the cults have a whole lot of common factors. They all sound like Christianity when they begin. They all offer you desirable benefits if you join them. They are generally authoritative. They know what they believe, they state what they believe, and they stick to it. They're always led by a personality who is dominant in the cult, and they all have a new revelation by and large, which is additional to or replacing the Scriptures. And they all call for young people or other folk joining them to give them total commitment. Many of them require money from their members, and many of them have a form of initiation which is little short of indoctrination, although the young person is not aware of it at the time. And often they profess a secret knowledge which is only revealed to those who are initiated into their organization. And they are very resentful of criticism. In fact, they are quick to intimidate or to sue for libel. They could do that on me tonight. Take the Moonies. Dr. Moon, he claims that Jesus appeared to him at a prayer in Easter Day, 1936. And he said that it was revealed to him in prayer that he would complete the great mission that Jesus began long ago. He asserts that he continually receives fresh revelations and practices soul travel to converse with Jesus, he says, and other religious leaders in the spirit world. One of their leaders is a man called Ken Suto, who teaches that the spirit world has already recognized Dr. Moon as the victor of the universe and the Lord of creation. And of course, the holy book of the what we call the Moonies is um, called the Divine Principle. In it, Dr. Moon claims that he presents a theological interpretation of the Bible, together with messages that he receives from the spirit world. He doesn't claim to be deity, though he gets very near to it. Quote, I had to pay indemnity for what has been lost by Jacob, Moses, and Jesus. I have paid a great amount of indemnity, and because of this, I have the right to forgive another's sins. As Christians, we prayed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we should pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But now we should pray in the name of the true parents. The true parents are now on earth. 
Let me quote to you what a girl who got sucked into this movement said. In the Oxford Times in 1981, 16th of January, people may think I was stupid, but they simply seemed like friendly people. I was invited to spend some time with them. It seemed a good way of passing time as I was at a loose end until my flight left. But I just got entangled in it all. She didn't first of all realize that they were Moonies. They called themselves a creative community. But she soon found out, and after being subjected to repetitive lecture se sessions about Dr. Moon, she says, I felt my hold on reality was beginning to go, and I had to get away. If it hadn't made a break, then I was afraid that I would go under and start believing everything they were preaching. I was never alone. I was never given any time to think. And looking back, it all seems very sinister and secretive. I still have nightmares thinking about it even now. And she eventually made her escape at night by climbing a wooden fence, wading a stream, running through a wood to a highway. And she dived into a ditch whenever a car passed from the direction of the camp. It is an experience which will be with me for the rest of my life, and I hope my story will act as a warning to other young people to be on their guard against approaches from groups like the Moonies, she said. Now, what is it that attracts young people into an organization like that, to take it for an example? Well, of course, there's hero worship. Everybody loves a hero and wants a hero to worship. There is the tremendous solidarity with other young people. There is the simplicity of their lifestyle in comparison with the hedonistic way that the West lives in their lifestyle. And young people like an authoritative lifestyle. And of course, they are filled with a sense that they're going to alter history. And young people would love to alter history for the better. And they look around and they say, well, decadent orthodox Christianity is doing nothing to help. Maybe this is the answer. And of course, all the time, the enemy is laughing. Satan is laughing at the deceptions that people swallow. He is delighted when people begin to worship the creature rather than the creator. And that can happen, you know, in evangelical churches just as much as it can anywhere else. It is the Lord Jesus who is the head of the church. It's the Lord Jesus who gives gifts to the church. And we must give him the glory for all that he does. But he doesn't always get it, does he? And Satan's influence, of course, sweeps right into a movement like this. And the cross is the key to Satan's defeat. But is it not amazing that in the Moonies Unification Church, the cross has become the symbol of Satan's victory to the Moonies? They say Jesus failed. He didn't complete his work. He was beaten at the cross. Dr. Moon has come to finish it. So the cross, rather than being their symbol of victory, the Christian symbol of victory, has become the symbol of Christ's defeat you'll find that they all go wrong, particularly on the cross and the doctrine of the cross. And of course, Moon practices clairvoyance and claims to talk with the spirit world. Is it any wonder to you that he does? It has a very Christian-sounding name. Do you know what they call themselves? The Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity. But in the back of it is Eastern occultism, all intertwined. And they use what they call heavenly deception. They say, if Satan deceived God's children, why should they not deceive Satan's children? And I told you about that campaign we had in the center of Seoul, in the great city of Seoul in South Korea. And we took a stadium there, and I was preaching there. I got there the first night. There were about 3,000 Koreans at the meeting, got up to preach. The next night I went, there were about 200. Because the Moonies had got in the crowd, give out leaflets, and said that I was one of them. Now, I may have a face like a moon, but I want to tell you something. I'm no moony. But they lied to the crowd. 
and the crowd fled like snow off a ditch. What a difficult time we had for the rest of that campaign. It was deadly. I remember sitting in the heat on a hill overlooking that vast city and crying to the Lord to give me power to reach it for Christ. And the Lord did bless us. That's another story. All I want to say is I've seen them at work with their lies. And the Unification Church is just one of many cult movements. There's the Divine Light Mission. There's the Hare Krishna movement. There's the children of God now on the wane. There's the Baha'i faith. There's Zen Buddhism. There's Scientology, all very much in evidence. And of course, there are lots of other cults which mix in with Christianity, which are deadly. There is, of course, Freemasonry. Very few church committees across the country not influenced by the Freemasons. Even men who preach in pulpits who belong to them. From the police force right down and up and around, they're everywhere. We've seen them and watched them. And let me say lovingly to any Freemasons here tonight, but let me say categorically, with all the sincerity of my heart, that no Christian should be a member of a secret society. Any secret society. Christ, when he saves a fellow or a girl, he sets them free. And no Christian should set themselves in bondage to any secret society or cult. Now, I know that many honorable men and respected men in our community find their way into Freemasonry. They're attracted by the very high moral ideals which the craft seeks to promote. Brotherhood, benevolence, tolerance, all highly commendable, they say. We're just promoting benevolence and brotherhood and tolerance. So respectable folk are drawn in. Philanthropic institutions, Masonic schools, hospitals, nursing homes, their great benevolent fund. Why, it's Christian, they tell me. It's a Christian organization. It is no such thing. Others are attracted by the air of mystery that surrounds the craft, the love of exclusivism. They're attracted by the comradeship that they get in there, which sometimes they can't find in a professing Christian church, much to our shame. And let me stand with the great Rainsbury tonight when he said the first Christian objection to Freemasonry is that secret societies are unscriptural. You know what Jesus said? Jesus didn't find a secret society. In John 8 and 20, he said, I speak openly to the world. In secret have I said nothing. Got it, Freemason? In secret have I said nothing. Matthew 10, 26, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. What ye hear in the ear, that preach from the housetops. Do you preach, sir, madam, or whatever, in the secret society to which you belong, what you hear in the ear in your secret society? Do you preach it from the housetops? Christ was able to do so. It's unscriptural, a secret society. Secondly, always remember that Masons teach that Jesus Christ is only one of many exemplars. They teach that our lovely Lord Jesus is not the only Savior of men. How can a Christian bow to that? There is one mediator, says the Word of God, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Secondly, of course, 
The Christian objection to Freemasonry is not only that secret societies are unscriptural, it is that a Freemason undertakes rash promises. The very structure of the different degrees of Freemasonry rests upon such wrong and immoral in the sense that God will not allow promises to be made of this kind. For when they make a promise in one degree after another, a man is required to bind himself in advance by a solemn oath on the Bible to secrecy and faithfulness in matters of which nothing has been revealed to him previously. He says, I won't tell anything, and I promise not to tell anything, even though he doesn't know what's coming. Now, of course, the worshipful master will say to the candidate, let me assure you that in these vows there is nothing incompatible with your civil, moral, or religious duties. But that's no excuse, because what right has any man to make another the custodian of his conscience? I cannot allow any other man to be the custodian of my conscience. As a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, that makes a man into God, that he can work out what is incompatible or compatible with my civil, moral, or religious duties. He must accept the judgment of a man who may not even be a Christian himself, who will decide what are proper religious issues or not. So we object to it with all of our hearts. Whenever a Christian moves into it, he's trapping himself into making rash promises. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips, says God's word to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid to him when he knoweth it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. Leviticus 5. The Bible will not allow you to make a promise that you'll go into something before you know what it is. How many a Christian has been drawn into this secret society and trapped? I'm warning, and I'm sure I'm for it. Thirdly, the third Christian objection to Freemasonry is to the monstrous Masonic oaths. Have you any idea of the oaths these people make? Quote, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, or nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these, cometh of evil, let it be yes or no. Don't say, I'll do it by my hand or by this or by hook or by crook or by anything. Your word should be your bond. When you say yes, you mean yes, and when you say no, you mean no. That's what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. How then can a Christian going into this organization make an oath like this? From a man kneeling on his knees with one hand resting on his Bible, these several points I solemnly swear to observe without equivocation or mental reservation of any kind, under no less a penalty on the violation of any of them than that of having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out by the root, and buried in the sand of the sea, or the more effective punishment of being branded as a willfully perjured individual, void of all moral worth, and totally unfit to be received into this worshipful lodge. Or when they're raised to the second degree, they will swear, again on bended knees, with hand on the Bible, these several points I solemnly swear to observe without evasion, equivocation, or mental reservation of any kind, under no less a penalty on the violation of any of them than that of having my left breast let open, my heart torn therefrom, and given to the ravenous birds of the air, or devouring beasts of the field as a prey. So help me, Almighty God, and keep me steadfast in my solemn obligation of a fellow craftsman mason. 
Or then when we come even higher and higher, what happens? A penalty of being severed in two, my body burned to ashes, and those ashes scattered over the face of the earth. Or higher, no less a penalty on the violation of any of them than that of suffering loss of life by having my head struck off. And Jesus said, I say unto you, swear not at all, but let your communication be yea, yea, or nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. And you know where the Masonic oaths come from, don't you? Every one of them. And how tragic it is that Christians get caught up in it. My fourth objection to Freemasonry is its exclusion of the Lord Jesus from its precincts. This is a fact that no honest Freemason can deny. The precious name of Jesus Christ is not allowed to be uttered in a Masonic lodge. There is a so-called worship in the lodge, but from that worship, Jesus Christ is deliberately excluded. There is so-called prayer in the lodge, but it's not offered in the name of Jesus Christ, through whom alone prayer is acceptable to God. There's praise in the Masonic lodge, but the precious name of Jesus is excised from every hymn. And the place where Jesus is not allowed is no place for a Christian. And, of course, we've got to remember that as far as they are concerned, Jesus is not the only Savior of men. And the great, the great God that they have, I'll explain to you what their name for him is in a minute. And it's not the Christian one or the one of the Bible. The fifth Christian objection to Freemasonry is that it rests upon a false doctrine of justification by works. They call it, in the second degree, a peculiar system of morality. A system of morality. That is the foundation of their system, a system of morality. But our Christian gospel is not a system of morality. Our Christian gospel is based upon one foundation and one foundation alone, that which is led, which is Jesus Christ. And that is the foundation. And then when we trust him, of course, the morality flows and follows. But it's not a system of morality is the foundation stone. It's Christ. And of course, these people, when they are initiated, they are told to stand over there in the northeast corner of that Masonic Lodge. You being newly admitted into masonry are placed at the northeast part of the lodge figuratively to represent the stone. The foundation stone's always led in the northeast corner, so you stand over there. And from the foundation led this evening, may you raise a superstructure perfect in its parts and honorable to the building, to the builder. No institution can boast a more solid foundation than that on which Freemasonry rests. That's the worshipful master's charge after initiation. The practice of every moral and social virtue you see, it sounds so beautiful, and thousands in it are sincere in trying to do a good work, but it takes away the very basic foundation on which the gospel is based. My sixth objection is that the last great objection tonight that I'm going to talk about to Freemasonry is that it is an apostate religion. It is a religion of a kind, their own meeting place, their own hymns, their own prayers, their own chaplains, and their own theology. But it's not a Christian theology. It is a universalistic religion, a universalistic religion. Let me quote Sir John Cockburn, a past Grand Deacon of England and a past Deputy Grand Master of Australia. This is what he said. If the title of religion be denied to Freemasonry, it may well claim the higher degree of a federation of religions. Ah, a federation of religions. It is a form of worship in which all religions can unite without sacrificing a jot of their respective creeds. Tell me, is our Lord Jesus meant to be called a jot? You see how subtle it is coming in upon people. And what about its name for God? This is the frightening bit. The climax of its worship and ritual is to introduce the initiate to the sacred name for God. 
For that name is supposed to have been lost and to be only known to Freemasons who are members of the so-called Holy Royal Arch. Their name is not for God. You will not recognize it, my friend. It's not in your Bible. It is Jah Bulon, which is a pagan name for God. The word is explained in the mystical lecture as consisting of certain titles or attributes of divinity to which in English no one could take exception. Yet this word is made up of the Hebrew word Yahweh, coupled with the Assyrian Baal, which is so utterly repugnant to the prophets, even as a symbol, and the Egyptian On or Horus. Horus was the corn god of Egypt, and he claimed to be the offspring of an unholy lance between the earth god Keb and the sky goddess Nut. And all that conglomeration is put together. Oh, what a blasphemous insult to the high and holy one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. And to associate his holy name even symbolically with such foul names as these. Yet that's exactly what Freemasons have the termity to do. The conclusion is unassailable. Christ and the craft are fundamentally opposed to each other. And if you're in it, Christian, get out. And if you're thinking about going into it, don't. And pray that those around you who are trapped by it will be set free from it. For I believe it to be more insidious than we can yet imagine. Here's the testimony of a man who left it. Well, I remember the wave of nausea as I stood and initiate outside the lodge and heard myself referred to as a poor candidate in a state of darkness who by God's help was seeking the light. How could any Christian bear it? God's grace had already shone in my heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This I knew, and as I stood there listening to the first utterance of Masonic ritual, I was aware of rampant evil. In vain I sought for some acknowledgement of the light of the world in the worship and in the ritual of the degrees that followed. There was nothing. The sense of blasphemy had become by the middle of the third degree ceremony so overwhelming that I moved to protest and to leave the temple never to return. Those are strong words I've made, but where else will you hear them? For I've never heard them in my life in a pulpit. It's time that the cover was blown and that the great architect of the universe that they worship is blown for what he is universalistic religion and not the God of the Bible. You think I'm fooling, friend. I'm not fooling. Satan comes through morality and man's love for good works and religion and blinds people. Ah, but there's more. I want not only to talk to you about cults and secret societies, well-meaning that Satan infiltrates and drags down, and when I think of Jonestown in Guyana and what happened through that pastor that started out so well and ended up so desperately with all those people committing suicide, that should be a mark on the face of the earth to believers forever, never to follow a man, but to follow only the Lord Jesus. For I declare to you that there are men who rise to teach the Word of God, and if the Word of God said something and they said opposite, people would believe them. That doesn't mean to say that God doesn't raise great men and use them in His church. Of course He does, but let's give, let's give them double honor if they're used of God. They're to be accounted double honor, the Bible says, for their work in the Word. But let's never worship them or put their Word above the Word of God. Give God the glory for them, not glory to them. But probably far worse than what I've been talking about tonight, of course it's far worse, is one of the greatest ploys of Satan on the face of the earth. It is the counterfeit of political religion. What are the three greatest, most powerful political forces of modern days? Let's think about them. 
The first one was the fascism of Nazi Germany. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute, because in Colossians, you're going to get some very powerful truth that's going to steamroll over all of this. It's very important you understand it. The fascism of Nazi Germany was a religion before it was finished. The great mass of rallies of Hitler, the fanatical conviction of the triumph of their cause, the adulation of their leader, their passion of sacrifice for the cause, their assurance that they would have a thousand-year Reich. It was all religious. It's hardly surprising that it came into violent conflict with the confessing church of the day, is it? Then the second great force in our day is the communism of Marx and Engels and Lenin. Again, you look at communism, what's it marked by? It's marked by a passionate adulation of the leader when alive and the worship of him when he's dead. I've stood in a queue in a red square in Moscow and seen the dead body of Lenin embalmed, and he's been dead 50 years. And I've watched those people stand and look at that body and worship him. And they'll stand there, maybe a queue a mile and a quarter long in the snow and in the heat or whatever, the condition of the season, and they throw God out, and they put Lenin in, and they worship him. I said to my leader, oh, he said, there's no God. I just believe in my mother and my father and my children, the guide who was taking us around all those days, who wouldn't give me the information about where the church was that I wanted to get to to worship the Lord. In fact, I sneaked away from him and jumped in a taxi and got there on me Todd. Praise the Lord with a few other guys. There wasn't a single car anywhere. There wasn't a bike anywhere on the street. And when the taxi man dropped us off, it was an empty street. There was one man standing outside a door. And I went over and I said, is this what I'm looking for? He said, yes, you must be in the brethren. <laughs> and I nearly died of shock. And he took me upstairs. And he showed me two, small b, he showed me 2,000 people absolutely jammed into a building tight that you could hardly move. And not a car or a bike or anything outside. You wouldn't know there was a meeting on, but boy, when you got in, you would have sure known it. And they were there all day, a bit like us, all night. <laughs> when the Lord starts to bless, fantastic. But no, my guide wouldn't have it. I said to him, I said, look, Velodia, I said, look, what a name. You have put Lenin in the place of God. You were worshiping him. He didn't like what I said, but he knew it was true. Once more, that idealism of sacrifice of thousands of young people who give everything to the cause. And Marx set out with the intention to deduce a reasonable interpretation of existence which would take the place of a decaying Christianity. And more of him in a minute. And the continuous fanatical opposition of the Ro Russian Communist Party against Christians is immediately intelligible when you see the religious dimension of communism. You cannot have two absolute allegiances in your life. You either have an allegiance to the party and nothing else. And of course, Christians absolutely give their allegiance to the lovely Lord Jesus. And you're not allowed to have both because they know the power of an allegiance to the Savior. And then, of course, there is the Chinese situation under Chairman Mao, inaugurated by Mao, has precisely the same character, the adulation of the leader, and so on. But notice the counterfeit of political religion is very similar to Christianity in its structure, uh, or the truth in its structure. I don't like that word Christianity as such. It's not a Bible word. It's bigger than that. The truth itself Notice that in all of those three great movements that have the masses of the earth tonight under their heel, there is the personality. 
Number one, there's Hitler, there's Lenin, or there's Mao. And the faithful deify their leader. He is supreme. His will must be obeyed. And this imperative overrules all others supplied by family or humanity or faith. The leader must be supreme in what he says. There is the leader, the personality. Then there is the faith, total commitment. Even if you throw like, like Alexander Solzhenitsyn did in his brilliant book, The Gulag Archipelago, what a book of compelling sarca sarcasm it is. The power of it, 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 you know, when you read it, it can hardly hold you. It is, you know, you can hardly hold, he can hardly hold back the hatred that he has against the system as he shows how Stalin literally, literally murdered millions. And the people just won't believe it. They won't see what's being done to them. No matter what contrary evidence is thrown against them, they'll still believe it. It is no mere intellectual acceptance. It's a total and passionate surrender to the party and to its teachings. And that's analogous to the Christian faith of total commitment. The devil puts in the counterfeit. They worship, they have faith in their leader, and political faith has taken the place of Christian faith in many parts of the world. And of course, they all have a holy book. Hitler had his Mein Kampf. Marx had his Das Kapital. Mao had his little red book. And these books have guided men in their daily lives. And their contents are learned off by heart by millions of people. And their citation closes all arguments. See the counterfeit. See the counterfeit all the time. Putting another book in the place of the Bible. Putting faith in the political party in the place of faith in God. Giving worship to a human fleshly leader instead of to the one almighty God of the Bible. Minho, the Maoist leader, said of the little red book, Exactly what evangelical Christians say about the Bible. We must study the works of President Mao every day. If we miss only one day, the problems will pile up. If we miss two days, we'll fall back. If we miss three days, we can no longer live. And then, of course, there is the dogma, which is incumbent upon the faithful and which applies to every side of life. The whole process of living by revising and commentating on the sacred text of their books, as they call it, on the one hand, and rejecting and persecuting those who don't follow it on the other. If you disagree, they'll persecute you, and they'll cut you off. Counterfeit religion. It's dreadful, but it's absolutely true. Huh? But I want to reveal a very interesting fact to you. Richard Wurmbrandt wrote a book called was Marx a Satanist? And he has revealed that at 18 years of age, young Karl Marx, who is the brain behind the whole thing of communism, in his early teens, he was involved in Christian things deeply. And then suddenly he changed. There was a Satanist group up the road. And his early poems give considerable evidence that he became involved with them. He wrote a drama, which was an inversion of a Christian hymn. And Satanists will often do that. They'll take a Christian hymn, and they'll invert it for their own purposes. And you can see on some products today that are on sale in our shops, the little Satanist sign, which is the inverted cross. Money going to them, of course. They'll invert sacred words to the Christians, and they'll invert even the, the cross, and they'll invert prayer, and they'll invert hymns for their own satanic practice. And he wrote a drama, and he pictures in this drama around the hymn Emmanuel, he pictures the abyss yawning in darkness, and himself wishing to draw the whole of mankind after him into this pit designed for the devil and his angels. I quote him, at 18, if there is something which devours, I leap within it. Though I bring the world to ruins, the world which bulks between me and the abyss, I'll smash it to pieces with my enduring curses. I'll throw my arms around its harsh reality, embracing me. The world will dumbly pass away and sink down to utter nothingness, perished with no existence. That would be really living. When he was only 18, he wrote that, and he had a great crisis in his life, and something had taken place. 
In a wee poem called The Fiddler that he wrote, The hellish vapor rise and fill the brain Till I go mad and my heart it utterly changed. See this sword? The prince of darkness sold it to me. Marx didn't become an atheist. No, no, he became a God-hater. He wrote a wee poem called The Pale Maiden, and he said, Thus heaven I forfeited, I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell. And that's the brain of the young man who was behind all the writings that have changed the face of the world. Engels, he was involved in Christian things too, and after his first meeting with Marx, he wrote of him as a monster possessed by thousands of devils. Engels also moved in Satanist circles. The famous professor Bruno Bayer and his teachings, which are still taught as orthodox communist teachings, when he stood up to lecture as a professor, he was actually put out of his chair for heresy. He said that he couldn't hold back the power that taught him to teach what he taught, the heresy that he talk and taught. And he said that the young people sitting in front of him, their hair stood on end while he lectured. Amazing. And he was under Satan's power. Let me quote him. I deliver lectures here at the university before a large audience. I don't recognize myself when I pronounce my blasphemies from the pulpit. They are so great that these children who nobody should offend have their hair standing on end. And while delivering the blasphemies, I remember how I worked piously at home writing an apology of the Holy Scriptures and of the Revelation. In any case, it is a very bad demon that possesses me as soon as I mount the pulpit, and I am so weak that I am compelled to yield to him, and my spirit of blasphemy will be satisfied only if I am authorized to preach openly as professor of the atheistic system. And he was teaching atheism, but all the time he knew he was being controlled by the devil. So at the very genesis of communism, can you see the occult? Hitler, Hess, Himmler, Goebbels, Goebbels, a whole lot of them, four great leaders of Nazism, were all fully involved in occult practices. And Germany, between the two world wars, was riddled, absolutely riddled with the occult, until it was said that communication with the other side was almost as common as with a friend next door. And as it spread all across Germany, is it any wonder what came after it? And we've seen on television this week what they did to those poor Jews as they now enact the trial of that angel of death who did all his genetic experiments upon them. You see, what I'm talking about, my friend, is not some little thing that's a fairy story. I'm talking about principalities and powers that are active in every state, and none more so than the totalitarian states where checks and balances of power have been removed. In Demetrius's Rome, in Hitler's Germany, in Stalin's Russia, in Mao's China, the state becomes a pseudo-religion, and the beast apes the lamb. And happy the nation that perceives it and acts before it's too late. And still, the prayer meetings are the least attended meetings in all churches in Ulster. Still. No matter what you say, no matter how you plead, people won't see it. And while the Satanists meet in this city to pray against fellows like me, and I could take you to the very place where they are at it, a church slumbers and sleeps. I haven't time to go into transcendental meditation in depth, but simply to say that the Maharishi Yogi, you remember he offered to buy over the McKenna factory in Liverpool, and he said that if he took over those 930 workers, they would be required to meditate for two hours every day. And he claimed that 1% of the people in an area when they practice TM, 
that crime is reduced and a state of general harmony is advanced. And of course, it's all sold to the people as being, uh, you know, develop your full potential as an individual. And yoga is involved with it to improve your governmental achievements, to realize the highest ideal of education, to maximize the intelligent use of the environment, to solve the problem of drug abuse and crime, to bring fulfillment to the economic aspirations of society and individuals, to achieve the spiritual goals of mankind in this generation. That's what he claims in his seven principles. That's pretty comprehensive, isn't it? That's your personal, political, educational, ecological, social, economic, and spiritual aspects of life. He doesn't need much out. And of course, it appears so funny and so great, and the Beatles go off to it, and everybody thinks it's a big laugh. And what they're not told, that TM is essentially a branch of Hinduism. And all pretense that it is non-religious is a deception for it stems directly from the Shankara tradition within, within Hinduism. The Maharaji himself acknowledges the tradition which maintains that the practice of TM passes through cycles of decline and revival following its initial revelation to the, wari, to the warrior Arjuna by the Lord Krishna some 5,000 years ago. And so Paul McCartney sings, My sweet Lord. It's incredible. The initiation ceremony into TM is the initiation ceremony of Hindus following the tradition of the Shankara. They bring offerings of six flowers representing life, three pieces of fruit representing the seed of life, and a white handkerchief representing cleansing. And there's a table holding a picture of the Maharaji's teacher. And the initiate is placed before an altar, and the teacher begins to sing in Sanskrit, a Vedic hymn of worship acknowledging Hindu deities. And of course, the person who's initiated into it doesn't get a translation. They all think it's just nice. And Dr. Arthur Williamson of Coleraine University has done a special study of this and appeared on television recently, and you go and talk to Arthur, and he'll tell you more about it than I know. He'll tell you that right in the middle of TM, there is a worship of Hindu deities. And of course, yoga and the whole thing is into it. And of course, people say, well, it's good exercise and all the rest of it gets you out of the fast lane. Yes, but it makes you awfully self-centered, doesn't it? It's me and how I feel and all the rest of it. That's the tragedy of it. And once you get into it, they will make no basic distinction often between good and evil, and the universe consists of one basic stuff. And the deeper you get in, there's no real straight morality of goodness. And of course, the repetition of the mantra will give you attendant self-hypnotism. Tragedy. Breaking down the differentia between the conscious and the subconscious, between good and evil and joy and suffering, and the divine and the human, and the basic philosophy is fallacious, and it is not surprising that deception marks the methodology of the leadership of this movement, and the deceiver of the brethren is delighted. And, of course, the motivation for yoga is self-improvement, and it is to deliver the self from its supposed imprisonment and release it by the self-redemption of meditation to discover its true deity. And that makes the practitioner of yoga utterly self-centered, and he's taken up with his own betterment, and the supremely selfish enemy of souls is gratified by this reproduction of his likeness. So that you see behind all of these things are very, very serious counterfeits. Ah, but the Word of God shows very clearly that it's not, it's not old, or not, not new, it's very old. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. And this is, you know, this is, forgive the word, it's mind-bending. Here Paul is writing to a church that had supposedly been set free by the Lord. And I want you young people, and I've spent a long time going through that tonight, because I want you to be warned of the Satanist, and of the, the principality and power might that is behind all of that thing and the false prophets that rise that will drag you in. Look at the false philosophy that there is in chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. None of the three manifestations of counterfeit religion 
are missing here, I can tell you. They're all here in Scripture. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, it offers eight indications or indicators of the counterfeit of truth. Now, I don't know precisely what the Colossian heresy was, but I think that some of these things uh, give a hint as to what it was. But it's very clear that they were advocating a means of salvation through a philosophy which was empty and counterfeit. And Paul warns, don't any of you Christians be dragged away from your freedom in Christ through false philosophy. Look, I did moral philosophy at Queen's for a year, and it's about the worst year I've ever lived. Worst year I've ever lived. We studied communism, and we studied, we studied all the great writers and, and philosophers to get a smattering of their teaching, and boy, I tell you, they did nothing for my soul. And I know many, many of you students are facing these problems. Don't, I warn you from Paul's letter, be deceived by false philosophy. You see, it would seem from chapter 3 and verse 11, it suggested that they thought their salvation lay in the knowledge which they alone possessed. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Have you noticed that your boast is Christ, that He is the base of your knowledge? There's no secret initiation as such. There was a co combination of paradoxical extremes. And the Gentiles believe that God is spirit and the world material. Therefore, the world must be the product of some inferior workman and that the good spiritual God is only remotely linked to the evil and the material world by intermediaries. And so you get Gnosticism coming in here where they believe that there were intermediaries angelology, worship of Michael the archangel, and so on, as the link between people and God. And they were teaching that the world of time and sense is an evil thing, imprisoning the soul, so you have to escape out of it. And they had all sorts of ways of getting out of it. How different to the gospel. A God who revealed himself both as a creator and a redeemer, as both spirit and source of all life, and the person of Christ, a God who made our world and yet at the same time shared our human state. Oh, it's so clear. Don't be fooled by their philosophies. Is there some young man listening to me now and you're trapped in a false philosophy that's drawing you away from the lovely Savior who bled and died for you? Fill on my heart goes out to you because I know where you are. Let this verse reach you just where you are now. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world. There's a whole lot of boys that sell you tradition for the Bible. And half of this stuff they're up to can't be found in the Bible. And they fight and argue over it day and night, and it's not even in the Word. And a whole lot of you are drawn away into it sometimes. And you are arguing and drawn into things and wasting your time and energy on the mere traditions of men that have nothing to do with the Word of God. Don't be drawn into it, says Paul. Don't let anybody draw you into a mere tradition. Look at chapter 2 and verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Oh, my God, give me power to expound this. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I remember once preaching in Korea, and a banker came to me and said, I'd like to talk to you. I went to his lovely home, got down on my hunkers at his table, no chairs, and started to eat. He was a very sophisticated man. He said, I don't understand you Christian preachers. He said, I go to the temple at the end of the day, and I sit there and get peace and quiet after the bank, but I go to your Christian meetings and you're telling me I'm a sinner and that I need to be saved, and then you present to me a perfect one called Jesus. How can a sinner like me ever find a perfect deity? And of course, this is what these boys were trying to say. We're fallen and God is perfect. How on earth can we find him? And they've got all sorts of mediators of Colossae who are trying to span the gulf 
but I'll tell you, friend, they either make them into angels to worship, and so sadly we have it today that some would even put the Blessed Virgin Mary in there as the mediator, and let me tell you, she's blessed, and let me tell you, she's virgin, and she was a very great woman. But whenever they came to her and said, what will we do? She said, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Mariolatry has no basis in the Word of God. Neither has any other worship of any other mediator. There is only one. Can I put it this way? Bridge that can have one, one foundation, one bit of the bridge here on earth, and the other bit right up there with the divine and the perfect, and can span it perfectly. It's the blessed God-man, and Jesus is his name. He is the mediator, my friend. He can span the gulf. It's achieved only by the Lord Jesus. He's firmly anchored on both sides of the divine. He's one with God and one with us. And many cults today will allow you some place given to the Lord Jesus, but not the supreme and only place. They want to supplement him with all the other mediators. It won't do. Almost all serious heresy goes wrong on Christology. They go wrong on the person of Christ. Jesus is the only sufficient bridge between God and man. Now, let me just get the grip on this text, for it's one of the greatest in the Bible. Notice what he says. In him, verse 9 of chapter 2, we've read it. In him. That means in him alone. He won't share it with anybody. Have you got it? In him dwells. It's not going to go away. It dwells in him. It has a permanent abode in him. In him alone permanently abides what? All the fullness. It's not distributed to angels or various mediators or thrones or principalities. For God has thrones and principalities and powers mentioned here in Colossians that Satan apes. But all the fullness isn't distributed to anybody. It's given to him and him alone. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. There are two Greek words for the deity of God. And here Paul takes the stronger one, which is the word for God, which we translate Godhead. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Bodily. It's not an ideal. It's not an ethereal Christ. But it's a human Christ who walked the streets of Palestine, and the fullness of God was permanently located in this lovely man and in him alone. The unique and mighty claim out of this great letter written by Paul to the Colossians of the sufficiency and total and absolute uniqueness of the person of the Lord Jesus. Never forget that text when you're faced with false cults or secret societies or whatever. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and he'll do more for you than yoga would ever do should you stand on your head till the blood comes out your ears. He'll do more for you than the trips to the farthest corner of the earth to have a holiday to find peace. He'll do more for you than all the secret societies with all their benefits combined. You ask someone who has known the Savior, and I'll tell you, they would be able to tell you. There sat a lady here last Tuesday, a lovely lady, quiet, godly lady, she longed to get to the class before she went home via London to Salisbury. She came and she was always encouraging me in the work of the Lord. A very godly lady. And she got on the plane to go to London and she was climbing up the gangway and going into the plane and she went higher than she ever thought she was going. She went right into the presence of the Lord, for she died on the plane, and I've got to take her funeral in the morning. 
And I'll tell you, if she could tell you tonight, only between here and there at the moment, there isn't that communication. But if she could tell you that she sat in that gallery or wherever last week, and tonight she's with Christ, she would reiterate to you, if you're not saved, it's time you were. Hundreds of you, maybe tonight, I don't know, not yet committed to Jesus Christ and not trusting him as his Savior. Oh, my friend, in the light of all the principalities and powers and the subtleness of Satan, may he be bound in this service at this moment, and may dozens of you surrender to Christ. For death is real and eternity is long. Not Jesus and Mary Baker Eddy. Not Jesus and the Reverend Moon. Not Jesus and Joseph Smith. In him and in him alone dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We preach Christ crucified. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. But these boys, they took a ring around Calvary. They neglected the significance of the cross. Why, says Paul, look at verse 13 of chapter 2, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. It's not in the meat you eat or the drink or respect of holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days. No, no, that's not the way you're going to be saved. That's what he's saying here. Don't let anybody beguile you, your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Verse 18, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? You Christians, you're away back into bondage, he says. What's wrong with you? Don't touch it. Taste not, handle not, touch not which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye were dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked for some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him whether there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. No rings around Calvary, no roundabouts, nailed to his cross. That's the secret. Counterfeit religion can't stand the cross. They find the cross a scandal. Eastern faiths, they don't take evil seriously. Forgiveness isn't a problem to them because they don't take evil seriously. The Jehovah Witnesses teach that the judgment at the end of the thousand years will depend how you have lived your life on your works. Unitarians, they believe that their salvation lies in moral values and spiritual insights. On all of those avenues, with the deepest respect, 
for individual people tonight, and without any hatred or arrogance on my part, they'll all lead you to despair and delusion. Only Christ and Christ alone is the mediator between God and man. Not Christ minus anything or Christ plus anything. No bogus ceremonialism. Festivals, observations of new moons. No, it'll do nothing for you. Baptism is not an initiation. All believers should be baptized, and if you're not a baptized believer, you should be. And only believers were baptized in the New Testament. But that's only an outward sign of an inward work. It's not an initiation into anything. That has already happened. No shallow moralism, no mortification of the flesh will bring you peace. We've seen that in this passage. No mysticism of pride and saying, well, I have arrived at a special place and the Lord has really blessed me and initiated me into some kind of secret thing. And I have more knowledge than the other Christian. And really, you know, those other Christians aren't up to the standard I'm up to. No, no. Hateful exclusivism will not be allowed by God. Absolutely not. No way. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, chapter 1, verse 28, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. There's no exclusivism in here. Look at the universality of the offer of the gospel of Christ. I'm not saying everybody will be saved. They won't. But look at how it goes out across the whole world, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, not just a special little clique. And that's why I hold this class. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what flag you fly. You're welcome. And as long as God gives me breath, I hope I'll get the chance to get to where the people are. And that I'll never get trapped into some exclusivism that will stop me giving to God's people and to those who are in need help. This message and this word and these truths about our lo lovely Savior are to be preached to everybody. I don't care what bank balance you have or don't have, what school you come from, friend. There is no exclusivism allowed within the church of Jesus Christ. Absolutely none. No place for pride. No place for social class. And if it's in there, it's got to be put out. Paul is pleading with them. These fellows are running around and saying, well, we have special knowledge and we know more than the others know. No. We'll not have it, he said. We warn every man. We teach every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Will you show me the exclusivism in the Apostle Paul? <laughs> Where did he go on a Sunday morning? When he arrived in cities up, he goes to the synagogue and right in there and saying, you know, you fellas, there's a better thing than this. What courage he had. And then, of course, they wouldn't take it, so he says, okay, I'll go to the Gentiles. But like the spirit of John Wesley when they threw him out for preaching the new birth of his denomination in the Church of England, he went out and he stood outside on the gravestone of his own father, and he stood on the top of it and preached the gospel. And so the gospel came to the masses, and England was saved from the French Revolution. So the little Billy Bray down in Devon, he said, why have they put me in a barrel for being a Christian? and they put the lid on, and they won't let me out, I'll shout hallelujah out the bunghole. <laughs> That's the spirit. It can't be bound to an exclusive group. It's got to reach all men everywhere, and it's time Ulster had that lesson. It's time it had that lesson. I had a great friend called Miss McCarthy who was a missionary with the China Inland Mission. I used to mow the lawn for her, not very well, but I tried. And I remember when I used to do that, she would talk to me about the Savior as a young lad. Do you know what she said to me? I said, Miss McCarthy, do you think revival will ever come to Ulster? She said, not until every denomination and every magazine, religious magazine, and every group and every whatever within the whole Christian church. She said, Un when, unless they all give up that little statement where they say, well, you know, the blessing came through us. 
we were the people the Lord blessed. She said, whenever we get to the place where we don't mind who the Lord uses as long as he uses them, and we fall on our knees and say, Lord, as long as you have the glory and you have the place and you have the preeminence, then we'll have the blessing. But I find as I travel around the country, all sorts of wee groups, they want the blessing for themselves. And it's like D.L. Moody said, there they are sitting over in the corner eating their gingerbread and they wouldn't give anybody any. Oh, Moody had it right for he was a great evangelist. He had a missionary heart. Why, he swept out, he swept out that beer hall on a Saturday night and he got the boys and girls into it on a Sunday morning. And he went to this church and he said, can I have a Sunday school class? They said, yes, if you go and find it. So he went out and he got 17 kids off the street and taught them himself. And he ended up with a thousand in his beer hall. And Abraham Lincoln came along to see it. He was so amazed. And then he went across the world and he said his duns for his dids and his dids for his duns. And he had his grammar all over the place. And the press had him for everything and called him for everything. But he got the gingerbread out to everybody. You know, I don't speak facetiously. I speak from my heart. A hateful exclusivism at Colossae. The devil is using it. An undiscriminating mysticism, a shallow moralism, a bogus ceremonialism, a ring road around Calvary, a broken bridge, a false philosophy. Away with them all. In Christ and in Christ alone is the answer. And in the Christian family, that's the way it must be. It is an open mystery to all. What a whiplash to those sectarian folk who thought they had arrived and that the ordinary run-of-the-mill Christian hadn't. Nothing must be allowed to separate those whom God has united to his Son as true born-again believers. And with their spiritual blindness on their sheer knowledge, and they were going by their knowledge, they were leading people away. No salvation by knowledge remains one of the hallmarks of the cult mentality. It fails to plumb the depth of the human situation. There's only one medicine for the cults. Spiritual regeneration. Not intellectual enlightenment. Conversion to Christ. Not membership of a cult. A new birth. Not a new insight. Christ was the apostle's answer to the counterfeit of truth at Colossae. And Christ is our answer. And I'll guarantee as I sing this final hymn, you'll see many a little lady and older one standing up with their eyes closed singing. And maybe a many a person out there in the world will say, look at them, and they'd mock them. But I'll tell you, they'll sing on. Why? Because every one of those women haven't been argued into the Christian faith. Because if somebody intelligent could argue the men, then somebody more intelligent could argue them out again. Every single one of them have been born into it if they know the Lord. There are many fellows and girls here tonight who will join with me in worship as we lift our hearts to this lovely Lord Jesus. And the world will say, what about Darwinism and evolution? And what about John Stuart Mill? And what about existentialism and Jean-Paul Sartre? And what about... J.S. Mill and all the rest of them and they'll throw everything at them and they'll say, no, it doesn't impress me. Well, why can we not argue you out of it? Because I wasn't argued into it. I was born into it. It was an experience. I was born of the Spirit with life from above. Thank God for the new birth and it'll hold you right through everything. Now go out there and don't get trapped by these false philosophies.